Okay, we have our second presentation today. Um, this is Lisa Lundgren. She's a PhD candidate at the Florida Museum of Natural History, University of Florida. And she will also be taking um, questions via Twitter. Sorry, what was your hashtag? Hashtag pub paleo. Hashtag pub paleo. <coughs> <clears throat> oh, I'm at the end. Thanks for coming, just kidding. Okay, hi all, thanks Amy for the introduction. Once again, I'm Lisa Lundgren and I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, University of Florida and I work with the Florida Museum of Natural History. And I'll be presenting today on social paleontology on social media, and it's a case study in developing social media best practices for museum projects. Um, and these museum projects are externally funded. So by externally funded, I mean I'm referring to projects that are funded by the National Science Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Science Services, or the National Endowment of the Arts and Humanities. And the project I specifically work on is the Fossil Project, and it's funded by the National Science Foundation. So the Fossil Project stands for Fostering Opportunities for Synergistic STEM with Informal Learners. But we call it Fossil because that's a long acronym. Um, we're based at the Florida Museum of Natural History, and we're affiliated with the University of Florida College of Education. And the goal of Fossil is to unite amateur and professional paleontologists in a community of practice. So a community of practice is defined by three different components. It's the domain, the people, and the practice. And for the Fossil Project, we define that as understanding the natural world through the collection, preparation, curation, and study of fossils and the science of paleontology. Um, the people within the Fossil Project are composed of fossil clubs, and these clubs are comprised of amateur paleontologists. So these people host meetings, conduct field trips, and use the internet to learn about paleontology. We also have professional paleontologists who are people who are paid to do paleontology. They do all the same sort of things that amateurs do, but they're paid. So these are people who are like curators at museums. <coughs> so with that background of the, the, the background information of the goals of the Fossil Project, um, I'll present to you a case study of the social media use in our project. And we're, since we're affiliated with a science museum, we have strategies that might be a little bit different than a museum who is um, looking to, to reach people through marketing purposes. We're looking to engage our audience to build the capacity to be more involved members of our community of practice. And we want to understand for whom and under what conditions engagement with our content can occur. So I'll be examining our two research questions very quickly. And the first research question is, in what ways do Fossil Project social media messages engage the community? And what patterns of engagement can be identified that are consistent with the community concept of our Fossil Project community of practice? So this is an example of one of our um, Facebook posts. And we maintain two social media platforms. We have Twitter and Facebook. And we maintain only these two platforms because of the nature of our audience. Amateur paleontologists tend to skew older, and that's a demographic that uses Facebook fairly heavily. When I go out with these amateur paleontologists and they say, have you heard of Instagram? No. Have you heard of Snapchat? No, I don't use Snapchat. So we really have focused on Facebook and Twitter, and especially Twitter for <laughs> professional paleontologists, because they use Twitter as a promotional platform for their own research and also as a news source. So we focused on that too. And we've seen some shifts in usage since the project began in 2013, but that is beyond the scope of this presentation. But if you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I'd love to, to chat with you about it. So the tools we use to design our social media messages across these two platforms are the same. And I use three tools. The first tool I use is Hootsuite. Um, and we've used Hootsuite since uh, 2015. So Hootsuite allows users to schedule posts as well as posts across platforms. But we use it for a scheduling tool um, because creating cross-platform posts don't really engage our audiences as much as we'd like to. 
We'll use the same stories across platforms, but we'll create images and content that are platform specific. The second tool I use to create posts is our Fossil Project marketing plan. So the Fossil Project is an externally funded grant, and we've built money into our budget to hire a web designer to build a website for the community to engage with each other. And as part of their services, they have a marketing plan which includes fonts and color schemes. And the fonts you can see are in this example posts, such as Source Sans Pro, right here, and Meriwether. And we use that in all of our social media posts. And we use the same color scheme across all of our social media posts as well. And that's this three-piece color scheme with our light orange right here, which you can see in my arrows, um, this dark blue and a grayish black. And you can see that in my branded presentation as well. And lastly, we use a tool called Canva.com and have been using Canva since 2015 as well. So Canva is a free tool that's website-based. You can create a free um, account to have more perks, but we haven't used it or needed that. We only have two people who manage the social media content with the Fossil Project. Um, and Canva allows us to create these quality images quickly. It's not Photoshop, but there's next to no learning curve for Canva. So it's a valuable tool if you are, say, looking to onboard interns who haven't used Photoshop in the past and want to use them to create quality images for your social media content too. So in order to answer our research questions about engaging with our audience to build their capacity to be more involved members of this community of practice, we designed our intervention to be longitudinal in nature. We've been doing this since May 2014. And the posts that we've created have been designed with purpose and direction and we focus on the way that the community engages with these posts. And for Facebook, we have three different levels of engagement. So the first level of engagement is designed by, is, excuse me, is defined by reactions. Um, and a reaction is often referred to as the lowest form of engagement, as a person merely clicks the like button or will hover over it to get a different reaction, such as a sad face or an angry face. Then there's the, third, the middle level of engagement, which is a share. And a share denotes a user including a post in their own or another's timeline. And this is a higher level of engagement than a like because it shows up in the activity feed more visibly than a reaction, although it's still a participatory behavior versus a contribution. So lastly, we have the idea of a comment on a post. And on a comment, the user is adding their own thoughts to the post. And this is the highest form of engagement because they must actively engage with the content in a deeper capacity. But I want to keep you to keep in mind there are some limitations to this. Users have begun using comments as tags at mentioning their friends. So that's not necessarily a contribution. That's more of a share because they're trying to get their friend to see the content. We also have comments that are less robust in nature, such as a single word like, cool. These are limitations that we recognize and we'll begin to look at with further research, but it hasn't been the focus of our study so far. So along with this idea of levels of engagement, we coded post types created by the Fossil Project. There's four different post types that we've created, and they can be broken into on-topic categories and one off-topic category. So this analytical framework we've used to examine the public Facebook pages of amateur fossil clubs around the United States as well, as well as our own Fossil Project Facebook page. So we have informational posts, and these are general resources for paleontology. We have news posts, which are media outlet stories about depictions of current research in the field. We have opportunity posts, which are posts that people in society can participate in, such as a field trip. And then we have research posts, which show some aspect of described scientific research, such as a refereed scientific journal article. And then there's off-topic posts. So this is a post that's not related to paleontology at all. This would be a post saying something like, happy birthday to a curator. So here's a post for you that maybe if we have, some, we have a little bit of time, would you like to code it real quick based on the coding framework? So it says, this might be one of our new favorite open access papers. It's all about ancient worms, specifically the process they use to reproduce, cocoons. Ciliate and iliads are ancient worms and being soft bodied, they don't show up in the fossil record that often, but their cocoons do. And those cocoons can reveal interesting, interesting patterns in environment and trends in worm reproduction. Hashtag OA Sunday. 
and then it's a link to an open access paper. <coughs> Boom, there it is. Yep, this is a research. This is, would be coded as a research paper or a research post. So let's get down to the data. What do we find? So all posts from this 24-month period were examined and coded. And what we found was the most engaged with posts were news posts. And what's striking here is that although we posted more opportunity posts and more informative posts, the Fossil Project social media participants chose to engage with content that's news related. And this shows that for our community, for our people who participate in the Fossil Project Facebook page, stories that are describing current research in the field for a lay audience are most engaged with. And I do want to point out that the language that we use to describe each post, whether it be information, news, opportunity, or research, wasn't a variable that we examined. But I can say that in creating posts, we used the language that was recommended by the marketing plan and tried to ensure that the majority of posts included a question. So the language used to describe the content would not necessarily skew our post type results. So within, this is for question, research question two, what kinds of engagement can be identified with this idea of community? And within a community of practice, people engage with one another with a shared goal. And for the fossil project, that goal is engaging in the practices of paleontology. And our messages are designed to focus on paleontology. And the participatory and contributory research, or excuse me, the participatory and contributory patterns of engagement can help us see how the community is shaped. So let's go back to this idea of a reaction. What is a reaction on Facebook? What is someone doing when they're clicking that like button? Well, according to research, participation by clicking a like button is a legitimate form of learning. But those reactions keep tacit knowledge tacit. And what I mean by that is, say a person likes a post that we've created about maybe dinosaur brain tissue. I don't know if anyone's seen the news lately that they've found a dinosaur brain. So say we create a post about that and someone clicks the like button. Why did someone like that post? Did the person have a story about the dinosaur brain tissue? Did they think that the image that we associated with the post was pretty, was neat looking? In our community, we're trying to get people to learn. We're trying to see how people learn. And so learners engage with one another and move through a continuum of expertise. And with reactions, with clicking a like button, those engagements, those learning experiences can't happen. So let's take a look at our percentages of engagement levels. This is in the middle column right here. We have 78% uh, of our engagement is in the form of these low level reactions. 16% is in shares, um, that middle form, and 6% is in the high level comments. Has anyone heard of the 1% rule by any chance, or the 99-1 rule? So in the 99-1 rule of, of principle, 90% of people on the internet are lurkers, or those who read content, saying very little about things or about the content that they're reading. 9% contribute in some capacity, but not at the same time. And 1% are the people who are the content creators. And with our social media, we found that we have around 6% of people who are acting as the content creators, the people who are creating comments on our page. So bet the difference between 1% and 6% is fairly large, especially for those of you who work at larger institutions who have large numbers of followings. And as an externally funded grant affiliated with the museum, we're doing fairly well in comparison to other externally funded grants. And I'm thinking of those grants associated with our museum. We have nearly 3,000 likes, and I know just after hearing um, from the Women's Museum that that seems like small potatoes, but for an externally funded grant, that's pretty good. We have a, another grant that's a sister grant to us, and they have 300 likes on Facebook. So we have 3,000. So there's a very, very different pattern of um, liking patterns for us versus a different grant. But what we want to do is try to implement these types of interventions with other externally funded grants and see the changes in followers and the changes of engagement levels. And another future research step we're considering is conducting research on the nature of comments on our Facebook page to see the degree to which they're educational or community building in nature. So to conclude, 
we have a couple of different ideas of best practices for encouraging communication in our community of practice. And for us, that was posting news stories. And we were able to, quote, beat the Facebook algorithm in some capacity by creating qual high quality images using our marketing plan and using Canva and using Hootsuite as a posting strategy. And we have this innovative capacity for, for building, or excuse me, we have this innovative approach for building capacity in that social media. So I'd like to leave you with a question. What types of posts are you creating for your audience and how is your audience engaging with them?